All right. Welcome back, everyone. Did you have a good lunch? Ish. Okay. Ish. <laughs> Are you guys excited for this next debate? What did you guys think of this morning? It was pretty entertaining and uh, interesting for sure. So you do know that um, for our topic today, we are going to try to answer the question, will AI take most of the existing jobs from humans? Okay, so that's our question right now. I feel this is a topic we could discuss for hours on end, quite frankly. Uh, so what we're going to do is just like last time, we were actually going to get people to raise their hands and tell us if they are part of team no or part of team yes on this question. And then we're going to do the same thing at the end. So really, it's up to our debaters to actually switch your opinion to come to their side. So I'm going to ask the question again, will AI take most of the existing jobs from humans? Uh, who is a no? Raise of hands, nice and high. Okay, Ramsey's my official counter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so not too many people. Um, and for people watching online, please drop your comments into uh, the chat. And um, so who is a yes to this question? I feel there's a few more. A few more yeses. Is that a fair observation? Yeah. yeah. So we have almost a 50-50 here. So that's going to make things especially interesting for today. Um, all right, so we have team no on this side of our debaters. Woo, team no. Uh, team yes on this side. And uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction, and then we're going to get into opening statements from everyone. So first up, we have Dr. Sedev Kocek is the Director of Professional Development with the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Is it okay if I call you Sedev? Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit more about what you do. Okay, so hello everyone. It's so nice to be here today in the afternoon. So after you have like a full belly, so uh, we need to get your uh, vote here. So uh, what I do at Vector, so I joined Vector two and a half years ago and I started as a uh, projects team. So I work with our industry partners as well as our um, governmental partners to uh, upskilling them. So when I switched to the uh, leading the professional development team, where I develop and uh, manage uh, upskilling and training programs for our sponsors and our, uh, you know, governmental partners uh, as well. So uh, before that, I did my PhD at uh, Ryerson University. Now it's called Toronto Metropolitan University, if I'm not mistaken. And I was working on uh, sustainability and um, software systems and uh, sustainable design, mostly on like an environmental focus. Excellent. Uh, welcome. All right. So next up, uh, also arguing for the no side, we have Dr. Jaron Colsarici, who's an associate professor at the Smith School of Business and also the director of the Scotiabank Center for Customer Analytics. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the work that you do. Um, thank you. Uh, it's wonderful being here. And I was really impressed with the morning debate. Uh, I think the sky is the limit for us. So we'll see what we're going to do. Um, I did my PhD at McGill University, um, focusing on marketing science, but I'm, I'm an engineer. I have my bachelor's degree in engineering. So, um, I have this interesting mix of skills and interests. Um, I'm the director of the Scotiabank Center of Customer Analytics. What we do is we collaborate with companies and government organizations and, uh, put AI and analytics into their, um, operations. Um, and implement projects for them to make their decision processes easier and more efficient and uh, more functional. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here and excited for the debate. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was a friendly start to the debate. It could turn at any time. Uh, nonetheless, now let's introduce our team. Yes, so first up we have Dr. Christian Muse, who's an assistant professor with the Queen School of Computing. And uh, tell us a little bit more about your research and what you do. Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, first, I'm very excited and thrilled to be sharing the stage with you all. This is going to be really fun. Uh, good luck to you, too. Uh, <laughs> um, so <laughs> We're going to need it. Well, yeah, no. So I, I did my PhD at the University of Toronto in automated planning, and then I globe taught 
for a little bit, went to Australia for a postdoc with multi-agent planning, and then back to MIT for some more temporal stuff, and then to industry for a little while, which I think will influence a lot of the arguments that I make today. Uh, for a couple of years with IBM, working with dialogue systems and, and things of the sort. Uh, right now, the lab works on understanding models and how machines can understand models and how we can understand how humans understand models to make machines understand models better and all of the stuff in between. Uh, so we do uh, a lot of uh, mixed symbolic and neurosymbolic and machine learning type of research in the lab. Um, and again, for Uh, finally, Ospenis, tell us a little bit more about your experience. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I work for Georgian. We are an investor investing in B2B SaaS growth stage companies, and I lead our applied research team. Post investment, we help our startup companies. We do risk innovation and research with them. We are an extension of their AI data science team, helping them to figure out what is relevant, what is not relevant, and how they can build and escape AI products. All right, a big round of applause for all of our debaters today. Again, I think everybody knows this, but what you were arguing is to answer this question, will AI take most of the existing jobs from humans? I see the robots staring at us as this is all happening. So uh, okay. we'll see what happens. Uh, again, you have five minutes each for opening statements. And um, I'm going to start with the no team. Uh, so set up, I'm gonna start with you and I'm gonna put a little clock down here just to keep you on time. We try to keep within the five minutes. Are you all set? Yes, I am all set. Are we? <laughs> yes. All right, cool. <laughs> all right, hello everyone. I'm not a debater by all means, but uh, I only debate when I do like a price matching. So just to let you know. Okay, so I would like you to all to imagine that um, you work all day on Thursday and then Thursday night you go home and then you are married or like you have kids and then you start packing a backpack. So you're putting your uh, kiddo's favorite toy, you're putting a blanket, you're putting a snacks and putting a, a water. So do you think you're going to uh, a trip? Or you're going to go to ER. So probably you're going to ER because you came from your work to school. Your kiddo is coughing, you're vomiting, and you want to take your kids to ER department in hospital, right? So recently you probably heard that the waiting time in ERs and sick kids around 10 plus hours. Can you imagine that your kiddo is sick and vomiting and you have to wait 10 hours? to see a doctor or like a, some sort of like a nurse or healthcare uh, professionals. So um, recently uh, the official said that, okay, so you have to pack your stuff before you go to, to ER. And then I tell you what, so the bad news is we've seen lots of lots of operational management or like a strategic work at the beginning to how we can increase, uh, you know, the efficiency of hospitals and whatnot. But the good news is we have AI technologies, so we can help those technologies can help us, right? So recently, you probably heard uh, if you live in Kingston, so then uh, in Kingston Hospital in September, they shut down one section of entire ER for a day because they don't have enough capacity. They don't have enough nurse. They don't have enough resources to take care of the ER patients. And then they move those patients into another um, hospital services where they may or may not get an attention or not, right? So think about those uh, experiences. And uh, I would like you to think about how AI can help in those circumstances, help those patients, help, help those, um, you know, the ER uh, circumstances and uh, are we able to train or get more people into AR? Because we don't have more staff, we don't have more nurses or like healthcare professionals. But what we can do is we can work with AI technologies and then we can try to find a solution for those technologies. So uh, you've seen maybe in the news that in recently um, at St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto. So one of our faculty members, so they, they tried to implement 
um, a uh, technologies with San Mike's Hospital. So that technology can uh, look at the, the patient's charts, like a more than maybe a hundred uh, variables at the same time. And um, they can uh, predict or they can assist to the um, healthcare patient, uh, healthcare professionals. So then the patient needs to go to ICU or not. So if you um, if you are in critical conditions, then you know you don't want to wait in the ER in twenty plus hours to see a doctor. You need to go to the ICU uh, to get your uh, get your uh, you know whatever that you need, right? So think about those circumstances, and I would like you to vote for no for uh, for this term. And then I give you another example that we always think about when we have this kind of circumstances um, and then we look at our historical, uh, you know, historical events. So when we have um, in, let's say, internet came to play, so everybody was so skeptic about the internet will get, you know, most of our job uh, and then we're gonna, you know, ended up with uh, like a shortage of people or no job and, I tell you what, what happened afterwards? Mm -hmm. So internet created more jobs. And then now it's almost like a 10% of, it contributes to 10% of the US GDP and even more maybe in Canada. So uh, when you think about in, let's say in um, 1800, so lots of people were working on the, the agriculture, right? There were farmers and, uh, and then what we have, you know, the machinerized and industrial revolution came up on the play. And now what happens? People adapt, right? So now around in the 80s, there are like 80% of people who are working on the farms in US, around like 90% are working on farms in Canada. But in 2020, the recent uh, lease, so 1.4% people work in the farms in Canada and around 2% work in uh, farms in the US. So did they change everything? Yes, it changed. But what we do is we found a different, uh, different ways of finding a job. We recycle ourselves. We uh, find a other ways to, you know, uh, to adapt this new technologies. So adoption is important. So how we need to do is we need to look at reskilling and upskilling of uh, our people. So I myself trained as a chemical engineer. So uh, in 20 years ago, but I'm not doing any chemical engineering anymore. I upskilled myself. I learned how to code when I was like at 30, 35, and then I switched to this AI space. So I found the way there wasn't any um, guidance or anything 20 years ago, but I find my way. But now the governments and, you know, the civil society and government and academic institutions now need to work together and upskilling of the people who may have, you know, uh, complain and losing their job and then they can find way to adapt the new technologies. And then thinking about the opportunities those new technologies have, but, uh, you know, when we go to uh, a new adaption of the technology, so we need to think about the opportunities that we have. All right. Thank you so much. You're a little bit over time, so we're going to have to give some time to everybody else just to be fair. Sorry about No, that. no, it's okay. No problem. So we're going to do about six minutes uh, instead of five if you feel you need it. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, and uh, Jaren, you're up next. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to build on Sedef's arguments, actually, and uh, I might not take all, all of my five minutes, so maybe that will that will bring us back to uh, <laughs> the right time, uh, but no promises, I'll try. So um, when I was first given this um, opportunity to participate in the debate, the question was very similar to uh, what uh, Amber uh, mentioned, but there was a sort of uh, amendment to that sentence that it said, Will AI going to replace most of the human jobs in the near future? So, and I wanted to frame that question a bit more specifically. I said, what constitutes most of the human jobs? I was asking it to myself. And what is the near future? So for my discussion, I limited myself for the next decade. And most human jobs would be more than 50% of human jobs will be replaced by AI. So that's the question I was trying to uh, answer or say no to. 
Um, so I first came across this question at, in 2018. I was attending the Marketing Science Conference and I was a keynote speak, speaker, a really accomplished uh, marketing science, science professor. She said, well, there's a website for this. Uh, you can go to that website with a robot take my job and put in your um, job position. And it, it gives you the probability of your job being taken over by robots. And I, of course, I did it immediately right that <laughs> night. Um, so academics, very unlikely to be taken over by robots, but I put in marketing, uh, marketing and sales director. So it was, it was a 0.01% likelihood that it's going to be replaced by a robot. And I asked myself, why is this? Um, then I, I teach AI and analytics, but in the business space related to marketing. And this always comes up in our discussions as well. And I started thinking about it more and more. So this, this debate really fits into my uh, sort of professional curiosity as well. Um, then I realized there's no debate about whether AI is going to be more influential in our lives. There's no debate. I think we will all agree that, that the answer to the question is yes. Um, so humans have intrinsic strengths. Machines have intrinsic strengths. So we have to understand the strengths of the machine and compare it to the strengths of the human. And when you think about this in, from that framework, machines are amazing predictors. Um, they have very little margin of error and they are designed um, to make strong predictions, both given historical data and uh, for, for the future as well. Humans are terrible predictors. Managers are biased. We're all individuals, even not in the managerial positions, are all biased. So we have to be aware of that. And uh, so this sort of, I guess, if you juxtapose the strengths and weaknesses together, um, I felt like we would make a really good team. So machines can help us, and that's building on Sedef's argument, machines can help us uh, become better decision makers. Because if you think about the decision-making framework, um, prediction is at the center because we make predictive decisions, small decisions, big decisions every day. Am I going to put my hair up in a ponytail? Am I going to wear this shirt? Is it small decisions? Or should I marry this guy? Or should I apply to that job in California? Big decisions. Um, and prediction is at the center of all of those decisions. But all the other components of that framework, and the most important one is judgment, machines suck at those uh, other complementary tasks to prediction. So humans are better uh, at judgment and there's no, there's no debate about that either. So um, in my last minute, uh, let me give you some uh, statistics based on research. So there's a recent paper published in Harvard Business Review uh, based on uh, multidisciplinary research. It says that 87 million jobs will be obsolete in the next five years. And it also says that it will most likely be replaced by 97 million new jobs. So there is a transition. And I think one of the Greek philosophers said the only constant in life is uh, change. So there is going to be a change. There's going to be a huge adaptation. And uh, some jobs will be obsolete. Mostly repetitive jobs will be obsolete, but uh, it will be replaced by new tasks that require a lot of sophistication, a lot of skill. Um, so that's mostly why I'm leaning more heavily towards the no side. We're going to adapt and evolve. Um, there's another research by McKinsey um, looking at a, a bit farther ahead into the future. It says 60% of jobs could be automated, but only 5% of jobs in the next decade will be fully replaced by machines. So um, it's a wonderful question to start considering. Um, but the answer for the near future, I would say for the next decade is uh, certainly no. Excellent. Uh, well done. I see the other team taking lots of notes when we have our challenge a little bit later on. So just a reminder that after our opening statements, you'll be able to challenge each of the teams. Uh, so Christian, I'm going to reset the clock and come over to you. And are you all set? Yeah, absolutely.
So Jaren and I had, I think, almost exactly the same uh, plan of attack for this. And so the website, actually, if you would like to go and play around with it, I shortened the URL for you, mulab.ai slash jobs. And you could go in and see which jobs are going to be next. Bloomberg still hosts the website, so it's it's a nice interactive one. Kind of finicky on the phone, but even better uh, later on if you want to check it on your machine. Um, I do want to spend uh, a good chunk of this time in the same way that you started sort of splitting hairs and figuring out pedantically, what are we going to talk about? Um, I didn't see the early draft of the of the debate on the near future, so I haven't defined near in any of the arguments that I have. But I did pick apart the yes, AI will take most of the existing jobs from humans. Um, from humans, that's kind of clear. AI, what constitutes as AI? I would like us to keep a broad view of what AI means and not just deep learning, because then maybe the next tech takes all the jobs, but that wasn't AI. I don't think we're here to talk about that. Uh, take, I guess we could define, like, are they going to without our will take our jobs um, i think we'll mostly be settled on there most i also included 50 percent plus epsilon right that's that's my count for most existing and uh, jobs are kind of the ambiguous ones right jobs is it stuff that you get paid for or is it stuff that we do as humans uh, perhaps stuff that we get paid for we can settle on that and then existing is probably the most finicky one and if we're going to talk past one another it'll be on the existing jobs so the jobs right now the jobs of 10 years ago or five years ago when the reports were written uh, the jobs in the future and when they sort of go um, and I think a twist on the entire thing is, is this just about unemployment or is it about transformation? So if we take a snapshot right now of all of the jobs that exist, if you were to go to monster.com and say, what jobs could I apply for? And then you ask, are 50% plus epsilon of those going to be removed? I think we can make the case that yes, those can be removed. Um, transformation is kind of a separate one. And I guess as the moderator, you can help steer the debates in which direction you would like to go. Um, but similarly, uh, some of these reports, there was an Oxford one, 47% of American jobs can be replaced with existing technology. Um, this is from a report called The Future of Employment, How Susceptible Are Jobs to Computerization? The interesting thing about that quote was that this was 2013 and deep learning was one year young. No, sorry, it was about 30 years young, but it was about its resurgence one year young and nobody understood really the impact of what was going to happen other than a few dozen people going to NeurIPS at the time. Um, and so, you know, if 47% of jobs around 2013 are susceptible to the replacement of you know, computerization at a snapshot almost a decade old, I imagine we've upped that to more than 50% plus epsilon. Um, we have a wide range of technologies that have dropped over the last just few weeks or few months that have moved the needle far greater than those of us in AI with thoughts it would be moving. Um, the latest one I think might be, I'm sure I'm missing some that came out this morning, but Whisper from OpenAI that is now doing transcription at a level the step function higher than what we had thought before. Um, GPT, we're on three, but I'm sure four and five will enter new things. A lot of the text to image based stuff is just making unbelievable waves right now. And there's a lot of discussion that goes with that. Um, so, I, you know, I guess the conversation could be steered towards transformation versus replacement, uh, whether or not we want to talk about are we going to face 50% plus epsilon unemployment in the world, or if it's the jobs that we see right now are going to be be half of them gone at some point in the future. Um, I have a few other arguments, but I think I'll hold on to those until later on in the discussion. Um, there was another note that I did want to make. Sorry. I'm going to have to consolidate all of these things that come down. You have lots of time, so no I pressure. do have lots of time, yeah. don't I? Right. So I don't have to keep rhyming off the different uh, sort of job things that have been transformed or replaced uh, because there is quite a lot and we'll come up with them as they go. But I think one really interesting point to sort of settle on is, is a job taken or is a job removed if you empower a single worker to work the strength of 10? or work the ability of 10. And so if you have somebody that drives a forklift on a warehouse floor, and all of a sudden there's a technology put in place with AI that there's one human that oversees 10 forklifts because only 2% of the time one of them fails and they need to back them out of that uh, corner. Um, I would argue that that's nine jobs lost rather than one job that's super powered by uh, the technology of AI. And I think this might be sort of a, a finicky point for us to discuss over the next hour or so. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, Paranaz, up to you next. I'm going to come over and just reset the timer for six minutes. Great. Thank you. 
I'm very excited because I guess the other debaters also argued in favor of <laughs> AI will, ex will replace most of the existing jobs. Existing <laughs> jobs. We are putting emphasis, highlighting the word existing jobs with their current requirements. So first of all, AI is replacing jobs, yes. A, but it's not very different from the other industry revolutions. It has been happening since 18 centuries. And of course, the first two industry revolutions, they took over more of the manual repetitive jobs. And with AI now, we started to, they, with the help of AI, we are seeing more of automation on more cognitive repetitive works. And then, I guess, a few years ago, even us, we were in this field working and we were kind of like, AI can never take over those jobs that require some level of creativity. It's only for humans. Humans, they are the only species that they have intuitions and they are creative. I'm so sorry for you if you also believed AI doesn't have creativity. As you mentioned, with GPT-3 and all these new advancements in deep learning, AI now can generate images, videos, text, even pieces of codes. I'm so sorry, computer scientists. They also they can also generate pieces of text, uh, code. And yes, it's not uniquely human anymore. Uh, what should be our reaction? Uh, maybe we can talk about it as well. So again, it wasn't. Maybe it was two, two, three decades ago that we called people who were doing computing computers. That's where the word computer came from, right? Am I right? So at some point um, in the past, we believed they, humans, they are the only people or things that they can do mass. It wasn't the case. We just at some point realized we thought that we are the only we can only understand the feelings and now we have all these models that they can understand your feelings as well more accurate maybe than humans as well create arts and even play strategic games uh, so i guess we've been in the situation before that we had to rethink what is uniquely human and maybe redefine what what it means to be human um, so again, it's not new, but, uh, what is new here? It's the pace of automation and shift in economy. Definitely that's the new one. So maybe rather than focusing on, uh, I guess it seems everybody agrees <laughs> that AI will take most of the existing jobs. So maybe we should focus on, okay, if AI will replace some of most of the existing jobs, then uh, what skill sets will be relevant in the future? What will be the new jobs that will be created? How computers and humans can interact more effectively? How we can work better together? As you sort of mentioned, like it's all about like uh, how we can augment each other. And at the end of the day, we have to understand these Machines, models, technologies, they also, they are somehow similar to us. You mentioned bias. Come on, models are biased too. They can even perpetuate some of the existing biases in our systems in a way, in a scale that no other sexist or racist person ever could have done. So, um, Yes, um, so maybe we should have to spend more time on like those uh, maybe trust issues of AI, like privacy and uh, and fairness. Uh, but uh, I'm hundred percent. I hundred percent believe that uh, AI will replace most of the existing jobs, but it will also help us to redefine who we are as humans. And uh, similar to what happened in the past, we will evolve as humans. Very well done. All right, a big round of applause for the opening statement. Okay, so um, just a reminder to the audience, we're gonna come to you in about 10 minutes for some questions. So think of some really good questions. 
And now I feel like this is my favorite part of the debates when we get each of the teams to challenge the other team and poke holes in what they just said. So each team is going to have uh, five minutes. I'm going to start the clock in just a second. I'm going to start with the, the yes team to challenge the no team. So you can ask as many questions as you want, sort of argue with key points that were brought up. And you have five minutes starting now. So Paranaz and, and Christian, over to you. Do you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, so, Seth, if you had mentioned a couple of points, and I think you brought it up as well, these uh, sort of transformational zones as humanity that we go through, um, what's quite often left out of the discussion is that there's a lot of pain paid during those transformations. And so in the industrialization of farming, there was a lot of farmers that were out of work and their kids and their grandkids learned new skills, but it's not like they were upskilled necessarily and then redirected to new ones. Um, and so in those types of phase transitions as you know, where the jobs might take us, I, I would argue that we lose jobs, existing jobs as part of that, even if they are replaced a generation down with different ones uh, to the argument of, yes, AI will take most of the existing jobs from humans. Um, this seems like it is very much relevant today as it was with farmers coming out of the fields uh, at that point. Would you agree with that? Or is it <laughs> is it a different type of phase transition you think we're in right now? Yeah, so um, thanks, Christian. So, uh, you know, it was in 1800s, right? So that time that there wasn't most of like a no, like academic institutions or governmental support and all that stuff. So like people uh, left out of jobs and then the farmers and whatnot, but they couldn't find the way that how can they go and, you know, reskill or upskill themselves. So it was like a very early times. But now when you look at the, uh, you know, all the initiatives that government and academic institutions and, you know, uh, even I teach to the adults. So they wanted to switch to the data science and analytics roles. So I've been teaching since 2014 and hundreds and hundreds of people, they wanted to learn like different skills, even if they wanted to stay in their jobs. What if something happens and then they wanted to learn a new skill? So we have this transition and we have this support from uh, from all over like a government and maybe even like, a, um, you know, the companies and whatnot. So uh, things are very different than from the early times. And then I feel like all of these kind of like a legitimate, but they still believe that we have a lot more support and a lot more initiative than before that we can support those upskilling, reskilling. All right, one more question from the yes team to the no team. Any comments on what they said you want to pick yes, up on? I have one question from you. You mentioned that humans are better in judgment. Where did it come from? Like, why do you think machines are not better or mod these machine learning models, they might not be better in judgment? Thank you. Good question. Um, I didn't want to use my five minutes to explain it. Now I'm going to use your five minutes <laughs> to explain my five minutes. <laughs> Nicely uh, done. So... I define judgment as the ability to make payoff decisions, the trade-off, payoff decisions of different trade-offs. Um, and when I think about judgment, I think about the Green Mile, the movie, um, versus O.J. Simpson case, you know, the alpha error, beta error. What's the cost of uh, letting a guilty person go free versus putting a, an innocent person behind bars or executing an innocent person? Um, that decision, if a machine is put in in a circumstance where they have to make that decision, I wouldn't be able to trust the machine. I might be able to trust a judge with 20 plus years of experience and emotions and a lot of different abstract concepts going into their decision making process. That's what, what I meant by when I said judgment. Also, in in the business situations, we, we we face it a lot. When I when I have an analytics or AI project, the model, uh, we do our best to unbiased the model. We tested uh, external validation and all of those things, uh, so we we're sure about the generalizability of the model. And it says something, and then you put it on the manager's desk. They look at the results, the coefficients, the optimal allocation, and something doesn't click. Right. So there's a there's a step. There has to be a step between the machine's output, whatever that is, and the actual decision, it has to, there has to be a human interference because otherwise 
things could go out of control. So that's that's where judgment comes in, uh, in my definition. I don't know if that answered your question. Can I answer? Yeah, you go course. ahead. Or maybe you, you weren't satisfied with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm an Iranian. I'm an, uh, I'm raised and grew up in Iran. And I don't know if you heard or not, but Iranian women are protesting in the streets. And we have a supreme leader. He's a human. He's not AI. And he's making judgments to kill these protesters every day in the streets because they are asking for their basic rights. Or we are dealing with Putin that who is bombing another country. And how can you trust another human in his judgments and you can't trust an AI. I mean, like not every human is reasonable. They all have their own moral risk system and they all have their own values. We can design AI systems in a way that they can optimize for their own moral systems and their values. So what's the difference here? Why you can't trust a, a like human mm -hmm. versus um, versus like a, a, an AI system which has been optimized and it has a loss function. And in that loss function, you can encode all these values as well um i really sympathize with the, with the iranian uh, women and everyone living there so anyways, that that aside um so again there are somebody is going to program that machine so whatever the loss function is it's going to be somebody or a group of somebody's decision so it's not that I don't trust machines. It's that machines are not independent uh, cognitive beings. Uh, they are programmed and influenced at, at the beginning or at certain milestones with um, human interference. So even in that situation, there will be human input. What I'm talking about is day-to-day -day decisions, business decisions, or uh, governmental decision, policy decisions, um, we cannot rely on pure artificial intelligence to make those decisions because there are many aspects of life, most of them are abstract, that we cannot incorporate into computer programs. Um, so that was what I meant when I said judgment. All right. Uh, as much as I want to continue this conversation, I, I do say we have to give your team a chance to challenge the other team. So you have about five, six minutes to get started um, to challenge the yes team. You can go first. No, I, I can go first. Okay. So I thought about, so one of my friends, Sammy, Sammy this AI um, website and machines were creating paintings it was so beautiful and i i said like i'm screwed well, how am i going to debate uh, when you saw me this <laughs> and then i and these are original paintings and in, they are not you know imitations of what what's already painted right so it's creative in in a, in a sense um then i when i think about works of mozart or beethoven real artists they evoke human emotion do you think a machine, they can create original art? Yes. Uh, but can it have the same influence as a, as a poet or a philosopher or a, or, a, or a real artist or a musician? Do you think that's the same level of creativity we're talking about? Is it for me or for you? Uh, open. <laughs> yeah, either one of you can answer, whoever feels most comfortable or brave. So I think it's in the eye of the beholder, and I think it's already happened. Um, and especially if you put it into a place of a uh, blind taste test of the artworks, right? There was the recent kerfuffle with somebody using Midjourney or one of these uh, text to image uh, websites that have popped up in the last month, submitting to what was thought to be a human only contest and winning. And it evoked emotion enough and it evoked the, the sense that it won the contest of this, uh, what was thought to be human submission. So that's the controversy is it's the artists that input the data to the machine that was learned that generated the AI and who's actually the one respond. The whole debate has started online and you can follow it now, but can the systems generate something to evoke emotion in the same way? I think it already has. Yeah. I don't know if it's you perfect. Know. Yeah. Thank you, Christopher. Yeah. All right. Another question from team no to team yes. Yes, I was going to ask like a similar question about when uh, Perina, as you were talking about, you know, the uh, taking over this kind of like a 
the jobs that it needs the creativity and entrepreneurship and whatnot. So how about like emotional intelligence? So what do you think about that kind of uh, the jobs that, you know, like think about like a nurses or think about like a social workers or think about like uh, uh, the mentors or like, you know, those kind of uh, once so have you thought about that maybe they fall into the transformation category mm -hmm. that we said like they will be augmented they're not going to be fully replaced but the job description will be different so we are looking for a different skill set so i wouldn't even i don't know if we might still call it a nurse but it re definitely requires different skill sets so i would call it a replacing existing nurse as it's defined by the job description now and it might be still called nurse and take care of the patients or people in the hospitals, but it requires different skill set. So I will still argue that it has been replaced. And do you think that it'll kind of like a personalized, uh, like emotional senses to the patient that what like a nurses could do, or think about like a, a daycare center, like a teacher. So would that uh, cause still like a transformation or? Transformation, they might, they, like for education tech, we are already seeing lots of like new softwares and tools and products that they are providing better personalized kind of uh, experience for the students, especially the students with the special needs. Actually, there are now better tools that like we believe that teachers might not be the ones, and still I don't believe teachers will be replaced, but they will be augmented with tools yeah. and technologies and softwares that can help them to do a better job. Yeah, of uh, course, like we're all, I think like the same page that, you know, we need to work with like these kind of technologies and augmenting those technologies into our day-to-day -day jobs, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a nurse, whether it's a firefighter. So then uh, we'll do like a, a better job or like, you know, uh, more productive and, you know, more like a sensitive and, you know, try to find like a more uh, resources into, I give you an example in the hospital, like a waiting 20 plus hours, it's insane. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, thank you. Was there a debate last year at this event on would an A, would you allow an AI to take care of your child? Yes. Right. There, what was the outcome of that debate? Um, <laughs> What was the, do you remember? Would you let a robot, robot take care of your child? I feel like the, it was a no, but if I yeah. remember correctly, it was a little bit of a different format because we were entirely virtual. So our voting mechanisms were limited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody gamed the system, I'm sure. <laughs> 10,000 votes. So I, I just wanted to, to mention on it that it's not that um, there will not be jobs. Uh, it is, uh, I'm triple negating things here and confusing myself, but there will be jobs that very well could be impervious to AI getting rid of them entirely. And there will be people who refuse to let a robot take care of their child or to be given a diagnosis from a doctor that comes from a robot or from an AI system. Um, but again, with the hair splitting claim up at the top, 50% plus epsilon, there's a lot of existing job descriptions that are on the chopping block to either be transformed or replaced entirely uh, by AI and automation. I think that's to come back to the, the main thesis of the question, yeah. Uh, team No, uh, you still have about a minute left. We can wrap it up, but do you have any more questions for the other team? I'm okay. You're good? Mm -hmm. um, all right, so this is where things tend to get a little heated because now the audience is coming into play and they're gonna challenge you. So we're gonna take a, at least 10 minutes for some audience questions. We had some pretty great questions this morning. So please do raise your hand and we will get you a mic. And if you don't mind just standing up so the cameras and the wonderful audience who is watching online can see you and, and feel free to direct your question to a certain team, if that makes He's asking sense. asking us. Okay. Hi, um, I guess this question will maybe be more to the benefit of the yes side, which I voted for, <laughs> just in all question. honesty. Yeah, yeah. But it's an open question to all of you as experts and perhaps um, on behalf of the, the general public who might be wondering what is, so maybe in the notion of employment or jobs, whether that's already embedded or encoded in, in your ambitions with AI. So my general question is, what is the end goal of AI? If it's if it's not in the context of jobs, or if it is, does that not answer your question already? So is the goal of creating artificial intelligence systems to replace jobs inherently? Or what is the, the final vision 10, 20, 50 years, 100 years into the future? If everything goes well, is this not already answered by your, your motivation? <laughs> Any volunteers? What or do you want to be voluntold? What is the end goal? What is the end state? Well, what is the yeah. ideal end state? <laughs> well, I'll start off and I'll continue. So um, I think it depends on us. 
So uh, what do we want to see us in five years, in three years, in 10 years? So uh, we would like to get a better uh, life or like a more sustainable world. So look at the climate change, look at all over, look at ourselves. Like we are producing two times more uh, waste in 20 years ago, two times more. So can you imagine that? So we won't have a uh, sustainable living for our kids, our children, our grandchildren. So we need to think about that. Where do you want to go? So how do you incorporate those technologies to help us towards a sustainable development, towards our planet Earth? We need to save us. We need to save our future. So that's how we want to go. Like this is how we need to think about how we are going to use the technologies. So, yeah, so another example, I think along along the lines uh, Sedef was going is um, energy conservation. So if you have smart homes um, that adjust temperature with little effort from the occupants, um, we could save huge um, megawatts of energy, uh, which, which is, you know, um, easy implementation of existing technology and it could change the world for the better um, in the near future. So I think when I when I when I think about AI, I always think about it in terms of making the world a better place, but also um, improving um, human decisions. So it's sort of like a helper. Um, and uh, I think over lunch, Matt, you talked about this mechanism, this machine, the robot, which cleans the oceans. Humans wouldn't be able to do it. It will require millions of people, millions of hours to do that, but the machine can do it really easily. And the machine can also um, transform that garbage into maybe something useful as well, right? So all of those things are uh, wonderful things AI can contribute to the world. Um, also taking over repetitive jobs and automated jobs as well. Uh, it frees up all of the uh, human labor to do more meaningful tasks. And that's where I see the value of AI. It, so my answer, it's really interesting to hear both of your answers. Um, I think ultimately it's a reflection of the individual or the society that's building the AI. The AI systems that I'm trying to create at the micro level help me grade assignments in my class in a fraction of the time, right? I'm applying AI to that because it's a reflection of what I need to do. So it's a tool to help me do my job better. But as a society, where do we direct our efforts towards AI for these big, grand, wicked challenges? It's kind of a reflection of the individual. Um, and it's also like in full response, a black mirror of individuals and societies as well to be used in nefarious ways. And again, it's, it's kind of just an echo of uh, who we are individually and sort of more broadly. Yeah. It's a good question. So. Yeah, thank you. All right, moving on to any other audience questions. Oh, wow, we have a few. Hi, sorry, I'm over here. Uh, I have a quick question. So I do agree with you that I think it makes sense that AI will take over repetitive jobs that are repetitive or um, jobs that humans can't do, like cleaning the ocean floor. But I think in order for AI to take over most jobs, there will be jobs that they need to take over that I would consider to be more complex. For example, I'm a structural engineer. Uh, and so we design buildings and bridges. Those are jobs in which me as the engineer, I'm liable for the work that I do. So if an AI system takes my job, who is liable? And how does that happen? It's a great question. I mean, we had a sort of similar question earlier today, uh, an insurance specific question, but it, it is a great question. Does anyone want to tackle it? We can, I know there's a bunch it's of questions. It's a similar question. Like it's a very good example, self-driving cars. That's like, you know, that's the main reason that we haven't, they are not as common in the, our society. So right now the liability is a big question. Um, so I don't have answer. It's not my expertise, but I have similar to any other questions. We can work on it and figure it out. So I don't believe it can be a barrier that can block automation of works. So it's just a legal, I guess, bunch of lawyers going to get together and then ask some computer scientists also <laughs> to, to help them understand who is building what, who is designing what, who is making decision on what. 
and then we can solve that. It's 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 not it's a question that we can definitely answer. Great answer. Uh, all right, there's a few more questions here. I said, gentleman in a mask. A few people around this area. Hello. So my question is is basically that here there's like an implicit assumption that we're primarily focusing on rich industrialized countries like Canada, U.S. that can actually afford to implement AI technology to replace jobs. But that's only constitutes a small percentage of the world population. So mo most people around the world, they're still working like subsistence farming jobs, like basic factory jobs, like in places like Cambodia or Somalia. So how would AI help replace those jobs eventually or, um, or not? So that's my question. Anyone want to give that one a... A try? I feel like that's a question for the yes team. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer. I'm from the business world. Unfortunately, it's all about money and it's all about cost. The main reason that all most of these automations are happening is the cost reduction. Is that we can build more scalable engines if we can build more cost efficient engines. I guess the main problems maybe in those other parts of the world, unfortunately, is that the labor is still very cheap. And access to technology is definitely more expensive. Access to the like AI schools uh, is definitely more expensive. So at the end of the day, if they do the kind of math, they realize, okay, it might still be reasonable from the business perspective to keep those manual work as they are. But it's, I'm hopefully that transformation going to happen in every bird in, in every bird in the world, as we are asking for a better standard of life everywhere, not only in like more Western countries, hopefully, if the labor gonna be more expensive, if the hourly rate gonna be more expensive, then the business owners will be forced to think about automation. And then hopefully with the more, I guess internet is also one of the drivers, maybe like comments, like there are more open source, um, everything's like more, some of these big techs are also uh, behind some of these kind of, uh, initiatives and projects to have more access, to make it more accessible, I guess, around the world. So I guess like it's, they might be behind, but it's just a matter of time. Um, I did see a couple other questions sort of in the right here. And I think a question that was back there. All right, so I think that the human, uh, has, like the human species has abilities from like a wide spectrum, right? So on this end of the spectrum would be the like the physical work. And then maybe here we would have stuff that would require a little bit of uh, like thinking, right? And then on the last end, it would be stuff related to creativity, emotions, and spiritualities, right? During the uh, industrial revolution, people were forced to, like before that, people were working in, in the whole spectrum. And then with the industrial revolution, they were forced or pushed to work on the last two. And then with the internet and stuff, like we were pushed to work in the creative part. And now I think AI is also replacing the creative and emotional part as the YES team was uh, debating. So where do you think can we push to like after this, uh, the end of the spectrum? I don't know. That's my answer. We will redefine who we are as humans, but it's part of, and it's part of our evolution. It's going to, like, our interaction with technology is going to shape again who we are. As you said, like, it happened before, it's going to happen again. I'm not a futurist. <laughs> I can't tell you. Maybe you have the answer. Well, I mean, it's a losing battle every time you say, but AI will never do this. The researchers will say, hold my beer, and they'll come back a couple of weeks later and they'll beat the world's <laughs> best, whatever it is that you just said. And yeah. it's it's a constant, constant rotation. Um, so I, I don't think you could, there will always be people that will say, no, no matter how smart the robot is, they will not take care of my child. Right? And so there will still be jobs that are irreplaceable for human uh, human reasons. Uh, but again, we're talking about 50% plus epsilon. Um, <laughs> and I, I just wanted to highlight, we are, we are arguing for the yes side, but it doesn't mean we have to like it necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of growing pains that go with this and people that will go yeah, unemployed with this. Behind. and. 
up upscaling and upskilling people is an essential part of it. And it's like I'm a believer of robot taxes and and things like this. And you can look up Bill Gates's ideas on it. But um, we're arguing for the yes, but we don't necessarily have to like it. Uh, we are just and, trying to be realistic. Uh, we uh, don't want to be illusional. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to go to closing statements from each of you and you'll have about three or four minutes. I, did you have a question right there? I thought, saw you raise your hand. Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah. Let's do two more. Did you have a question or? Yeah, you did. Okay. Uh, hello. So my question would be, uh, for example, to incorporate emotions, uh, I mean, incorporate creativity into models, probably we need to uh, define uh, models uh, for emotions as well, right? So is it possible to model human emotions? Let's hope not. No, I'm kidding. Uh, That's a good question. Any comments on that one? said all, all models are wrong some are useful there are models for emotions George Box. Emotion detection. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly not all of them are correct maybe some of them are useful I don't yeah. know yeah yeah good question um and then one more question and then afterwards we're going to do closing statements from each of you oh hello so my question is that there is some discrepancy between the knowledge of AI and replacing the job because if we think of like physical jobs, we have to extract the knowledge from the AI and then do some physical works like for the robots. So I think there is a huge gap in there. So my question is, how many years do you guys have in mind for the replacing the jobs? Like it can be like more than thousand years. So and I, my first question was like, how many years do you expect? for the replacing the job. And second question is, I think I heard that many people used to believe that intuition and creativity is kind of human things, but now we see that creativity is not only for the humans, but what about the intuition? Because I've always seen the models for like common sense and ethics, like from the models from Allen Institute of AI, but I don't think that that one is kind of understanding the human's common sense. So what's your opinion about the intuition for the human? Uh, so those are really two two sort of different questions. The first one about the length of the time for this to happen. Who wants to potentially tackle that? Oh, I can I get, go like a quick answer. I don't know. We are not futurists. Like we don't know. Uh, but think about like how long did it Jeffrey Hinton to, you know, starting from, you know, the deep learning uh, stuff and then come to 2023 and almost like, you know, uh, more than three decades, right? So, uh, and then now we are talking about like a self driving cars and taxis and, you know, the transportation. But it's been maybe a, a, a decade or so, they started this kind of like a research and whatnot. We're still not there yet. So, and I don't think that we're going to be ever uh, there in the near future. I don't know how long, but uh, you, when you think about this kind of like a evolvements and now we have like a more research going on, more technology, maybe it'll accelerate a bit, but um, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> My answer is all about the cost again. Um, it's all about when we can build these robots systems in more efficient ways and when economically it's going to be more reasonable to replace them because they are cheaper. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you never know. Again, the pace is, you, you mentioned deep learning and the pace it takes, it took three decades. I don't believe anything going to take that long anymore because the pace is crazy now. Yeah. Um, and then the technology always like a pace the technology exactly. and triggers the technologies as well. Exactly. Like, like exactly. how many researchers, like look at this room. Like we have a lot of researchers like working on like a different challenges, different, you know, wicked questions and so on. Even if we stop, think about it, even if we stop like working on this, what's going to happen all these research? Mm -hmm. Right, they're turning to a science. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So uh, think about those kind of questions. So again, like, you know, of course, like uh, you ask questions, I ask questions back to you, but, you know, 
we don't have an answer to those ones, but what we need to do, what we need, but we are know that, you know, we all, we all do some research and then we always try to answer those questions as we can. And then being within like a trust or ethics issues and whatnot. So those are also like, you know, we haven't touched it on those yet. I think like in the morning session, there were some discussion around this. I was just catch it in like a five minutes, I think. But yeah. I actually have one quick question um, that I would love to ask because just as you're speaking, you know, it, it strikes me that I, I'm looking at uh, Rob over here and um, looking at uh, the AV setup and you're doing the job of kind of what used to take six people, you know, there's sort of robotic cameras right here. I walk into my local Loblaws, nobody works there anymore. I have to scan my own items. So uh, I guess my question is to the, to the, the, the moderate or sorry, the, um, debaters is like, are we joking ourselves that we aren't already here? Like, isn't this? I mean, I know I'm not trying to be on the side of the. the it's okay, you can join. You can join. I told you, everyone's yeah. on our side. This conversation about the near future, yeah. like we don't even need to Recent past. include that because it's it's happening. If you just open your eyes, everywhere around us, I don't know. Yep, hundred percent. It's around us. Uh, so uh, all the all of the examples you gave, I think those are the ones that we were saying we were just saying there's no debate about sure. that. So all of the examples that you've mentioned are um you know easy tasks that are yeah. that can be handled by machines, that it should be handled by machines. Um I don't think there's any objection from any of us about any of those. But the big question is. And I don't want to go into my closing statement because I'm going to save all of that. But I think the real difficult question is which jobs are not going to be, are machines not going to be able to do? Sure. Either in the far future or near future. Because there are those jobs that are always built, will be. And just to, as a shout out to the AV team, I don't think what you do is easy because my husband is a cameraman and uh, uh, he's just had to learn different skills, right? And be able to do more things. So we can have a, a, another conversation about that, but we do need to get into our closing statement. So I'm going to give you three minutes each. Uh, do you guys want the timer or do you feel good without it? I'm okay. okay. You're quick? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so Def, let's start with you. Sure. And thanks everyone again, so for supporting us and the no team. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've, the fear of artificial intelligence uh, is legit, legit, legitimate. So I'm not an economist. So I throw those numbers at you and you know, all this like an employment, employment and all that stuff. But I really want you to think about it is the opportunities of the, these technologies working with humans is enormous. And it'll also overcome on the the other, like a, you know, the pro, you have to think about like pros and cons. And then the opportunities is humongous. And we see lots of them are here. And then we all know that like a, all of, uh, we mentioned that, you know, they're always taking out their like a repetitive jobs, but we are not out of job anytime soon because we have lots of, lots of problems to solve. So this is my closing comments. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much, Jaren. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to give you a few examples of what I meant by um, human AI. Let's work together. So one example is from Amazon. And um, one of the things we use a lot, at least the AI sort of uh, methodology we use a lot in marketing is in the business spaces, recommendation systems. So when you log into your Amazon account, it will recommend you um, a number of items for you to buy. And the prediction accuracy of that recommendation engine is something the data scientists are continuously working to improve. So there's a threshold, let's say it's 20% predictive accuracy now. So one of every five things I'm shown, I buy. But as, as they improve the recommendation engine's prediction accuracy, there is a threshold. I don't know what that threshold is, 50%, 60%. When they hit that threshold, the executives at Amazon are going to say, let's change our business model. So I'm talking about disruptive AI now. Uh, the current business model of Amazon is uh, shop and then ship. So we shop and then they ship. But let's say at 60% threshold, Amazon will say, 
and the machines won't say this, the managers are going to say this, they will say, well, it's cost effective enough now that we can ship to Jeran's door 10 items and we know she's going to buy six of them and she's going to send, send the back, uh, four of them she doesn't want back to us. So who decides that, that that threshold is the right threshold? Who decides that it's the time to shift the business model? It's not going to be the machine. So this is a great example, I think, of combining the strengths. So when, if Amazon switches to ship and then shop model, what else they need to do? They need to do vertical integration. They need to have um, take care of the transportation, uh, delivery of the um, of the packages because they're going to be delivering so much more now. Maybe they will uh, have an alliance with FedEx or maybe they will form their own uh, delivery company, right? That's not going to be a machine decision. That's going to be a human decision. Strong managerial decision. Uh, again, combining forces. Um, we talked about nurses and patient care. Uh, we talked about child care. All of those decisions, um, we have to have a cost-benefit analysis. If a machine drops a package, the stakes are not that high. If a machine drops a newborn, the stakes are huge, right? So that's going to be a cost-benefit analysis. I'm not saying it's never going to happen. I'm just saying it's not going to happen in the next decade. So. Um, we work with many companies, Christian does as well. One of the Scotia Bank uh, ideas that we were playing with was, uh, let's predict call center conversations. So can managers predict, can a machine or AI predict what uh, SEDEF is going to call uh, RBC next about, okay? We can, have a, we can build a strong AI model using NLP um, to predict what SEDEF is gonna call us about. Let's say next week we're expecting Sedef to call us about a mortgage. Okay, excellent information. Is machine capable enough to know what to do with that information? No. Most managers are not capable enough to know what to do with that information. Mm -hmm. So when I when we talk about in, influ, in improving skill sets, um, we're saying if machines do a better job figuring out what SEDEF is going to call us about, that manager's decision to understand what to do with that information becomes so much more important. So it increases the value of the good decision as well. Uh, that's building um, the partnership with AI. So all of those things, um, I think, doesn't point out to jobs being replaced by AI but world becoming a better place with AI and human decisions becoming more important with AI. So that's my position and thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much to uh, team no. Next up, team yes, some final comments, Christian. Yeah, I think you guys were dealt a hard card. I would agree with everything, a lot of the things that you've just said, but um, you know, if, if AI for some reason and robotics just hit a flashpoint and took every single job, and I mean take as in take tomorrow, and they needed all of the humans to like spin battery packs so that they could be charged and run the world, we would all have jobs, employment would be at 0%, but they've still taken all of our jobs. And like, it's an extreme example, but AI, I mean, you cited the Harvard study, 87 million will be obsolete. It'll be replaced by 97 million. And actually that's World Economic Forum. I missed, sorry, I missed World Economic Forum, okay. I, it was my mistake. I said Harvard, but that that's was- okay, I'll mistake. propagate the mistakes. No, 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 just, <laughs> um, but it, it, even in that setting, I would still argue that um, the jobs have been taken by AI and they have been replaced at the same time but the existing jobs that are there right now, the job descriptions that we see, 50% plus epsilon will disappear at some point in the near future. Um, the, the final thing that I'll quote on this um, is from a, a blog post that I saw, a trusted source. Uh, it's Amber Max Innovation 2020 Top 5 AI Trends. And number four oh, that was listed God. there uh, <laughs> from Amber Max. Amber Max. AI Max. trends in a room full of research. No, no, no. So recent research studies estimate that up to 50% of workers are at risk of losing their jobs over the next decade. And so it gives a time point. And I guess those were words that you were citing from somebody else. So you, yes. you don't have to. Thank you. Yeah, Thank okay. You. Um, but still, it establishes that that the existing uh, state of the workforce is changing and has such a churn that I think it's fairly easy to argue 50% plus epsilon in the mid near term even uh, is going to be impacted by AI. So that would be my final 
Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Karen S. Yes, it's happening. And let's, instead of argue whether it's happening or not happening, let's argue what should we do and how we can prepare for the future that robots, AI, whatever you want to call it, automation will be more common. Let's, uh, let's talk about some of the ethical issues we're going to face. As you said, liability and legal is just one piece. Compliance is one piece. For me, I'm personally very passionate about fairness. And I believe, like, rather than discussing a book, something that is hap already happening, maybe we should try to increase awareness around the fairness and bias problems in AI. These systems, they can be, say, sexist, they can be racist, and they will, if we don't think about it and proactively address it, they will perpetuate all these existing biases in our societies. Um, again, it's about, it's going to left behind portion of the population. What should we do? How we can risk? prepare for that kind of wave when it's happening or it's already happening, how we can prepare them or what's, what is our roles and responsibilities as people in tech. Uh, as you mentioned, we are at the end of the day decision makers to some extent, what kind of products, what problems we're going to prioritize, what issues are the top issues of the society. So let's make sure, first of all, it's more inclusive. Let's make sure we have more opinions rather than only spe uh, specific uh, micro segments of the population only in text. Like let's have more in, let's make it more inclusive and have a di more diverse um, set of people involved in the, those types of decisions and what kind of problems we're going to prioritize um, as we are thinking about the future. Excellent. Uh, another big round of applause for our debaters. All right, so now this is when we get to do our sort of uh, official raise of hands in terms of how you're feeling now after this debate. Also encourage people who are watching online to let us know in the comments. So let's start. Um, will AI take most of existing jobs from humans? Most of the existing jobs. Uh, who is on team yes? Good percentage of the room. Uh, what about team no? I feel like the yes one. All right. All right. Congratulations, team yes. But, but don't go just yet, because this is where we get to do confessions of a debater. So you get to tell us if there's anything that you didn't get to say because you were appointed to a team that you really, really want to say right now or a way that you feel. Uh, we had some great comments last time. Anyone want to jump in here? <laughs> um, so I didn't really pick no. <laughs> and I'm I'm on the fence. And I think if you consider existing jobs, that was a really good angle. I would totally go after that word as well if I was on your team. Um, yes, existing jobs. I think AI will um, take most of them, but we'll have many more new jobs uh, because we'll be transforming. Yeah. So I second that. So, uh, you know, we're not going to out of jobs, as I mentioned that, because we have lots of lots of problems to solve so let's get together with the augmentation of technologies and ai and solve those problems and leave our children's and grandchildren's and better planet earth absolutely any confession well you guys are just sitting there gloating <laughs> i mean if you had argued hard on unemployment right is ai ever going to lead to unemployment of being 50 percent plus epsilon then I would, I would have to argue the no side right that that's where i would have flipped uh, flipped the bill but again it's not arguing the yes side doesn't mean that we're in favor of it it can be sure. painful or it can be uh it can be wonderful if the upskill is in place and there is support for it and so i uh, yeah we do it is happening and we do need to be mindful of how it happens yeah. I could have argued if I was on the other side that it's with with the help of AI we can work less. For example, mm -hmm. now we there there are lots of studies that AI will be the main driver for the four day work week. That's another way of thinking mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. 
I don't want to work less. <laughs> I need you lots of problems as well. Like, you know, I have kids. That's... <laughs> I need to get money. <laughs> Presumably you get paid the same if that were yes, a perfect world. Exactly. Uh, all right. Well, thank you to all of our debaters. Feel free to have a seat and thank you so much.